Hello and welcome back again. This is our second to the last week of school. So we have two more weeks of school. Kind of crazy. So this week we actually don't have any graded assignments. The only thing that is mandatory for you is that you do your attendance form every day. There are some optional assignments posted. Um, in reading, you've got a writing classwork and a comprehensions classwork. Those are a comprehension questions classwork, sorry. Those are both optional assignments. They are not for a grade. Our grades are due into focus this week, so we are officially done taking grades for this school year. Um, for social studies, there are some brain pop videos as well as quizzes posted for you to do for optional assignments and they are just a review of our yearly standards. Um, I've linked some videos about the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, women's rights, um, immigration, money, just some things that we've covered throughout the entire school year. And as you know, Brain Pop has lots of videos and you can watch any of those, take quizzes on them, and they also have games. But like I said, there are no graded assignments this week. The only thing that you are required to do is your daily attendance. I will have two Zoom sessions as always, 8 a.m. on Monday morning and 1245 on Friday afternoon. And those are just going to be kind of pop in and say hi Zoom sessions this week. There's not really going to be anything that I'm covering. If you've got questions that you have about the end of the school year or questions about grades, that kind of thing, pop in and ask those or you can send me a message on Dojo. Don't forget that Monday, May 25th is going to be a holiday. It is Memorial Day. So we will not have school, not this upcoming Monday, but the next, the last week of school. That Monday is out, and then the last few days of school, the Tuesday through Friday, are going to be some different activity days. So we're going to have a craft day, we're going to have a game day, we're going to have a fitness day, and then a teacher choice day. And for each of those days, we are going to be doing Zoom sessions for those, but those are the only things that you have to do. Normally, we would have those days in school, but we're going to do some Zoom sessions and try to make the last week of school still a fun week for you guys. In addition to all of that, we are going to also be finishing the one and only Ivan. This week we are going to read pages 106 through 206, and then next week I will also post another um, YouTube video like always, and I'll be finishing the book. So if you have um, not read the book yet, I did put an electronic copy on Connect for you to read if you want to read it on your own, or if you would like to watch the videos of me reading, you can do that too. I'm going to go ahead and dive into the one and only Ivan. I loved getting to see you guys in Zoom this week and having um, you guys tell me what your favorite parts are in the book so far. I really like this book. Um, we did talk in Zoom, some of us, about how it is a little sad. Um, but a lot of what they're talking about is true. It is from an animal's point of view, but it is true. So while I'm reading this week and while you're listening or reading along in the PDF, I want you to think about um, animals in captivity, maybe animals in zoos, animals in circuses, animals in the wild. Um, what are your thoughts? How do you feel about it? Do you think animals should be in circuses? Do you think they should be in zoos? Do you think they should only be in the wild? This book brings up a lot of those questions, um, and I think that's really a good thing for us to think about because um, sometimes we forget that there are so many animals in situations like Ivan and Stella and Ruby. Um, and so I think this definitely brings up some questions that we may not normally think about, but it is a good thing to consider and think about. Page 106, a hit. Stella's foot hurts too much for her to do any hard tricks for the two o'clock show. Instead, Mac pulls her, limping, into the ring where she tracks a circle into the sawdust. Ruby clings to her like a shadow. Ruby's eyes go wide when Snickers jumps on Stella's back, then leaps onto her head. 
At the four o'clock show, Stella can only get as far as the entrance to the ring. Ruby refuses to leave her side. At the seven o'clock show, Stella stays in her domain. When Matt comes for Ruby, Stella whispers something in her ear. Ruby looks at her, pleadingly, but after a moment, she follows Mac to the ring. Ruby stands alone. The bright lights make her blink. She flaps her ears. She makes her tiny trumpet sound. The humans stop eating their popcorn. They coo. They clap. Ruby is a hit. I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Worry. When Julia arrives after the show, she brings three thick books, one pencil, and something she calls magic markers. Here, Ivan, she says, and she slides two magic markers and a piece of paper into my domain. I like the sundown colors, red and purple, but I don't feel like coloring. I'm worried about Stella. All evening she's been quiet and she hasn't eaten a bit of her dinner. Julia follows my gaze. Where is Stella anyway? she asks, and she goes to Stella's gate. Ruby extends her trunk and Julia pats it. Hi, baby, she says. Is Stella all right? Stella is lying in a pile of dirty hay. Her breath is ragged. Dad, Julia calls. Could you come here a minute? George sets aside his mop. Do you think she's okay, Dad? Julia asks. Look at the way she's breathing. Can we call Mac? I think there's something really wrong. He must know about her, George rubs his chin. He always knows, but a vet costs money, Julia. Please? Julia's eyes are wet. Call him, Dad. George gazes at Stella. He puts his hands on his hips and sighs. He calls Mac. I can't hear all of his words, but I can see George's lips tighten into a grim line. Gorilla expressions and human expressions are a lot alike. Max says the vet's coming in the morning if Stella's not any better, he tells Julia. He says he's not going to let her die on him, not after all the money he's put into her. George strokes Julia's hair. She'll be all right. She's a tough old girl. Julia sits by Stella's domain until it's time to go home. She doesn't do her homework. She doesn't even draw. The Promise My domain gleams with moonlight when I awake to the sound of Stella's calls. Ivan, Stella says in a hoarse whisper. Ivan? I'm here, Stella. I sit up abruptly, and Bob topples off my stomach. I run to a window. I can see Ruby next to Stella, sleeping soundly. Ivan, I want you to promise me something, Stella says. Anything, I say. I've never asked for a promise before because promises are forever, and forever is an unusually long time, especially when you're in a cage. Domain, I correct. Domain, she agrees. I straighten to my full height. I promise, Stella. I say in a voice like my father's. But you haven't even heard what I'm asking yet, she says, and she closes her eyes for a moment. Her great chest shudders. I promise anyway. Stella doesn't say anything for a long time. Never mind, she finally says. I don't know what I was thinking. The pain is making me addled. Ruby stirs. Her trunk moves as if she is reaching for something that isn't there. When I say the words, they surprise me. You want me to take care of Ruby? Stella nods, a small gesture that makes her wince. If she could have a life that's different from mine. She needs a safe place, Ivan. Not, not here, I say. It would be easier to promise to stop eating, to stop breathing, to stop being a gorilla. I promise, Stella, I say. I promise it on my word as a silverback. Knowing. Before Mac, before Bob, even before Ruby, I know that Stella is gone. I know it the way you know that summer is over and winter is on its way. I just know. Stella once teased me that elephants are superior because they feel more joy and more grief than apes. Your gorilla hearts are made of ice, Ivan, she said, her eyes glittering. Ours are made of fire. Right now, I would give all the yogurt raisins in all the world for a heart made of ice. Five men. 
Bob heard from a rat, a reliable sort, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. Comfort. All day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good and happy life? That she lived as she was meant to live? That she died with those who loved her most nearby? At least the last is true. Crying. Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. When George sees Mac, he runs to him. I can only hear a few of his words. Vet. Should have. Wrong. Mac shrugs. His shoulders droop. He leaves without a word. When George wipes the fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. The one and only Ivan. When all the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay, and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glare at him. You told her that? You promised Stella, Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain, and for a moment, it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess. But I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says. Mighty Silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it. Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time. All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep. Please, for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he is on my stomach. I hear a stirring. A stirring. Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella. Ruby sobs, and I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins, too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. <sighs> oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, Once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. The Grunt I was born in a place humans call Central Africa, in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I love to play Tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her and we would bounce on that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. That game never got old. Although my father might have disagreed.
Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit. But mostly, I used mud. And that is what they called me. Mud. To a human, mud might not sound like much. But to me, it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were ten of us, my father the silverback, my mother and three other adult females, a juvenile male called a blackback, and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then, as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback is meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector. And nobody could chest beat like my father. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult, how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly, or they will fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, cup your palms to amplify the sound, how to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go, how to be, str how to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. The End One day, a still day when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine after they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate that smelled of urine and fear. Somehow I knew that in order to live, I had to let my old life die. But my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine, stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. The temporary humans. It was Mac who pried open that crate. Mac who bought me. And Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers. I drank from a bottle. I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too. Especially when I broke something, which was often. Here is what I broke while I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three shower curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, three toes, my own. I broke the blender when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue into it. I broke my toes, attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there are many ways to break a glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me in their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up and said, Could I have some extra ketchup for my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to a movie theater, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on a birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. Hunger. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Island dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, Lying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skilled touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, 
for the easy safety of my nearby troop, foraging through shadows. Remember what happened to Tag, I told myself. Don't think about the jungle. Sometime, still, sometimes I lay awake, wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfall. But every now and then, I long to search for a tender stalk of arrowfoot, to feel the tease of a mango just out of reach. Still life. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat, wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It's called a still life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Mac's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at squirrels, Mac said. I couldn't take my eyes off the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They looked so real, so inviting, so edible. I reached out to touch a grape, and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan. Don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would ya? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake. Love it, in fact. But it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting peaked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting. I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect, an empty, white, waiting canvas. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and, of course, more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have even... My, I may have eaten a little cake, too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint. A banana, most likely. I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble. But at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something, anything, the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Back in those days, the Big Top Mall was smaller. It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bedraggled parrots, and a surly spider monkey. But when Mac brought me, a baby gorilla dressed in a crisp tuxedo, to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held me in their laps. Once I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid she would fall that I squeezed her tightly, and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby's eyes. Too big for their faces and for the world. Beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were wo woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be, too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily, but human ways are hard to learn, especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled, and who wouldn't have been? 
It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop Max keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch reruns on TV. But many days I forget what I am supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. Nine thousand eight hundred and seventy-six days. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob, too, is snoring. But my mind is still racing. For perhaps the first time ever, I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more X's, and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My marks look like this. The rest of the night, I mark the days, and when I'm done, my wall looks like this. And so on, until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he is anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches, too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's raining outside, and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby, Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands. Now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should just call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes sawdust off of his jeans. I am through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he is carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful like the sliver of a moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with a sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. 
I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Max says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Max says. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move. Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him. Somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down on the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off toward his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud. When Mac is gone, Julian, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh food and water. Before long, Ruby's dozing. Dad, Julia asks as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone, George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down, I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging a finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad, Julia asks again. Did you see Mac's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says solemnly. I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away, and only then do I hear him laughing. Colors. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares, green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to grow, seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper, then taps at the red square. When the brush meets a damp paper, pink petals of curl color unfurl like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off that magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella. Almost. Julia touches the red again, then blue, and there, suddenly, is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue, and her paper turns to summer sky. Black and white, and now I see that she is painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hip, gazing at her work. She scowls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Gingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars. One yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars and an odd not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides some paper through. 
These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really, I'm too old for finger painting. I stick a finger into the red jar. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas underfoot. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly right mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it. You paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on it. See? Like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it, and a red mark is there. I get a, a bigger glob from the pot and slap my hand down on the page. When I pull my hand off the paper, its red twin stays behind. This isn't like the ghostly handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't be so easily wiped away. A bad dream. I lie awake, peeling dried red paint off my fingertips. Bob, who accidentally walked on one of my paintings, is licking his red paws. Every so often, I glance over at the empty ring. The claw stick glints in the moonlight. Stop! No! Ruby's frantic cries startle me. Ruby, I call. You're having a bad dream. You're okay. You're safe. Where's Stella? She asks, gulping for air. Before I can answer, she says, Never mind. I remember now. Go back to sleep, Ruby, I say. You've had a hard day. I can't go back to sleep, she says. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick, and it hurt. I look at Bob, and he looks back at me. Oh, Ruby says. Oh, Mac. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think... She hesitates. Do you think Mac is mad because I hurt him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are terrible liars. Probably, I finally say. He ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives a scornful laugh. Crawled away is more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branches claw at the roof. A light rain drums. One of the parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks the silence. Ivan, I smell something funny. He can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I say. What are finger paints, Ruby asks. You make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Maybe someday. I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth a million dollars. I hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see, Ruby says. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trunks? I examine the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? That's called artistic license, Bob says. Ruby sighs. Could you tell me another story? She asks. I don't think I can ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember, I say with a helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story, she says. Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep returning to Mac and his claw stick. Anything yet? Ruby asks. I'm working on it. Ivan, Ruby presses. Bob said you were going to save me. I, I search for true words. I'm working on that too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low I can barely hear her. I have another question. I can tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of her door. Do you think? She asks that I'll die in this domain someday, like Aunt Stella. Once again, I consider lying, but when I look at Ruby, the half-formed words die in my throat. Not if I can help it, I say instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot. And it's not a domain, I add. I pause, and then I say it. It's a cage. The story. I look at the ring layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight, at the half-hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. Is it a made-up story or a true one, Ruby asks. True, I say. I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them the way a still pond holds stars. 
Once upon a time, I say, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo? Ruby asks softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there? Ruby asks. She had a friend, I say. A friend who made a promise. How? How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning. What you said about the zoo? How are you going to do it? Suddenly I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't, I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he's running in his dreams. Remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella and the pictures I've made for Ruby, and I remember. I remember it all. <clears throat> what they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something else to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am, the one and only Ivan, bathed in the pink light of dawn. I look so angry with my furrowed brow and clenched fists. I look the way my father did the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurt raisins. But inside me, hidden, is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs off his body. In the flicker of time, it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air. He could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. I stare at the one and only Ivan, at the faded picture of Stella, and I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall in Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers, coated in red paint, the color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. Days. During the days, I wait. During the nights, I paint. I worry when Mac takes Ruby into the ring. He carries the claw stick with him all the time now. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have to. Ruby isn't fighting back anymore. She does whatever Mac asks. Nights. I close my eyes. I dip my fingers into the paint. When I'm done with one piece of paper, I set it aside to dry. It's so small, just one sheet, and I'm going to need so many. I move on to the next, and the next, and the next. It's a, gi it's a giant puzzle, and I'm making the pieces one by one. By morning, my floor is covered with paintings. I hide the paintings under my pool of dirty water before Mac can see them. I don't want them to end up in the gift store selling for $20 a piece, 25 with frame. These paintings are for Ruby, every one of them. Project. Ivan, Ruby asks one morning when I'm trying to nap, why are you always so sleepy during the day? I've been working on a project at night, I tell her. What's a project? It's a thing, a painting. It's a painting for you, actually, I answer. Ruby looks pleased. Can I see it? Not yet. Ruby pokes with annoyance at her roped foot. She takes a breath. Ivan, do I have to do the shows with Mac today? I'm afraid so. I'm sorry, Ruby. Ruby dips her trunk into her water bucket. 
That's okay, she says. I already knew the answer. Not right. It's night again and everyone's asleep. I look at the picture I've just made, one of dozens. It's smudged and torn, a muddy blur. I place it beside the others lining my floor. The colors are wrong. The shapes are off. It looks like nothing. It's not what I'm trying to create. It's not what it's meant to be. It's not right, and I don't know why. Across the parking lot, the billboard beckons as it always does. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan Mighty Silverback. If I could use human words to say what I need to say, this would all be so easy. Instead, I have my pots of paint and my ragged pages. I sigh. My fingertips glow like jungle flowers. I try again. Going nowhere. I watch Ruby plod around the ring in endless circles going nowhere. More visitors have been coming, but not many. Max says Ruby's not picking up the slack after all. He says he's cutting back on our food. He says he's turning off the heat at night to save money. Ruby looks thinner to me, more wrinkled than Stella ever was. Do you think Ruby's eating enough? I ask Bob. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, though. You're sure as heck painting enough. Bob wrinkles his nose. That stench is unbelievable. And I found yellow paint in my tail this morning. Bob isn't happy about my night painting. He says it's unnatural. Now, while I work at my art, Bob sleeps on not tag. He claims he prefers her because she doesn't snore. He says her belly doesn't rise and fall and make him seasick. What is this plan of yours anyway? Bob asks. If you explained it to me, I could help out. He gnaws at his tail. Maybe I could come up with something that doesn't involve, you know, paint. I can't explain it, I tell him. It's an idea in my head, but I can't get it right. And anyway, I'm almost out of supplies. I should have known I wouldn't have enough. I kick at my tire swing. It's spattered with drops of blue paint. It's a stupid idea. I doubt that, Bob says. Smelly, yes. Stupid, never. Bad guys. <clears throat> Most of the day I doze. Late in the afternoon, Mac approaches. Bob slips under not tag. He prefers to keep a low profile around Mac. Mac's gaze falls on my pool. A corner of one of my paintings is visible. What's that, big guy? He asks. I calmly eat an orange, ignoring him, but my heart is racing. Mac kicks at my plastic pool. Underneath it are all the paintings. Mac yanks on a piece of paper. It slips out easily, and he doesn't seem to notice the other paintings. The page is striped with green, which is what happens when blue paint and yellow paint get together. It's supposed to be a patch of grass. Not bad. Where'd you get the paint anyway? George's kid? He considers. Hmm. I'll bet I can get 30 for this picture. Maybe even 40. Mac turns on my TV. It's a western. There's a human with a big hat and a small gun. He has a shiny star pinned to his chest. That means he is the sheriff and he will be getting rid of all of the bad guys. If this sells quick, I'm getting you some more of that paint, buddy, Max says. He walks away with my painting, Ruby's painting. For a moment, I imagine what it would feel like to be the sheriff. Add. Good news, huh? Bob says when Max out of earshot. Looks like you might be getting some more supplies. I don't want to paint for Mac, I say. I'm painting for Ruby. You can do both, Bob says. You're an artist after all. While I watch the movie, I try to come up with a new hiding place for my paintings. Maybe, I think, I could fold them once they're dry and stuff them into knot tag. It's a long movie. At the end, the sheriff marries the woman who owns the saloon, which is a watering hole for humans, but not horses. It's been a long time since I've seen a western that was also a romance. I like that movie, I say to Bob. Too many horses, not enough dogs, he continues. Or he comments. An ad comes on. I don't understand ads. They're not like westerns, where you know who the bad guy is supposed to be. And they're hardly ever romantic, unless the man and the woman are brushing their teeth before they face lick. I watch an ad for underarm deodorant. 
How do you know who's who if they don't smell? I asked Bob. Humans reek, Bob replies. They just don't notice because they have incompetent noses. Another act comes on. I see children and their parents buying tickets, just like the tickets Max sells. They laugh, enjoying their ice cream cones as they walk down a path. They pause to watch two sleepy-eyed cats, huge and striped, dozing in long grass. Tigers, I know, because I saw them on a nature show once. Words flash on the screen, accompanied by a drawing of a red giraffe. The giraffe vanishes. I see a human family staring at another kind of family. Elephants, old and young. They're surrounded by rocks and trees and grass and room to wander. It's a wild cage, a zoo. I see where it begins and where it ends. The wall that says you are this and we are that and that is how it will always be. It's not a perfect place. Even in just a few fleeting seconds on my TV screen, I can see that. A perfect place would not need walls. But it's the place I need. I gaze at the elephants and then I look over at Ruby, small and alone. Before the ad ends, I try to remember every last detail. Rocks, trees, tails, trunks. It's the picture I need to paint. Imagining. It's different now when I paint. I'm not painting what I see in front of me, a banana, an apple. I'm painting what I see in my head, things that don't exist, at least not yet. Not tag. I pull out not tag stuffing. Carefully, I fill her with my paintings, hiding them so Mac won't sell them. She's large, bigger than Bob, but I still have to crumple a few of them. Bob tries to settle on her for a nap. You killed her, he complains. I had to, I say. I miss your stomach, Bob admits. It's so spacious. When Julia arrives, she noticed that I've used up my pa paints and paper. Wow, Julia shakes her head. You are one serious artist, Ivan. One more thing. My finger painting has sold for $40 with frame. Mac is happy. He brings me a huge pile of paper and big buckets of paint. Get to work, he says. I paint for Mac during the day and for Ruby at night. I nap when I can. But my nighttime picture isn't quite right. It's big, that's for sure. When I place all the pieces on the floor of my cage side by side, the cement is almost completely covered. But something is still missing. Bob says I'm crazy. There's Ruby, he says, pointing with his nose. There's the zoo. There are other elephants. What's wrong with it? It needs one more thing, I say. Bob groans. Ugh, you're being a temperamental artist. What could be missing? I stare at the huge expanse of colors and shapes. I don't know how to explain to Bob that it isn't done yet. I'll just have to wait, I say at last. Something will come to me, and then I'll know my painting is finally ready. The seven o'clock show. During the last show of the day, Ruby seems tired. When she stumbles, Mac reaches for the claw stick. I tense, waiting for her to strike back. Ruby doesn't even flinch. She just keeps plodding along, and after a while, Snickers jumps onto her back. Twelve. I lie in my cage with Bob on my stomach. We are watching Julia do her homework. She doesn't seem to be enjoying it. I can tell because she is sighing more than usual. Again, for the hundredth time, or maybe the thousandth, I wonder what is missing from my painting. And for the hundredth time, or maybe the thousandth, I don't have an answer. Dad, Julia says as George passes by with a mop, can I ask you a question? May I, George corrects, ask away. Julia glances down at a piece of paper. What's the difference between the word, word spelled P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L and the one spelled P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E? The first one is the head of a school, like Miss Garcia. The second one is a belief that helps you know what's right or wrong, he smiles. For example, it's against my principles to do my daughter's homework for her. Julia groans. If I'm going to be an artist when I grow up, why do I need to know how to spell? With a laugh, George heads off. 
Poor Julia, I think. Gorillas get by just fine without learning how to spell. All those endless letters, those sticks and circles and zigzags, filling up books and magazines, billboards and candy wrappers. Words. Humans love their words. I leap up. Bob goes flying straight into my pool. A word. You know how I feel about wet feet, Bob yells. He scrambles out of the water, shaking each foot in dismay. I look out my window at the billboard. I can still hear Mac's voice in my head. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan, mighty Silverback. I count to 12, and then I count again, just to be sure. H. I lay out 16 pieces of poster board. Four down, four across. A perfect square. What are you up to? Bob demands. I'm guessing it doesn't involve sleep. It has to do with a billboard. That sign's a monstrosity, particularly since I'm not featured. I grab my bucket of red paint. You're not on the billboard because you're not in the show, I point out. Technically, I don't even live here, Bob says with a sniff. I am homeless by choice. I know, I'm just saying. I study the billboard, then I make two fat lines like broom handles. Another fat line connects them. I stand back. What do you think? What is it? No, wait, let me guess. A ladder? Not a ladder, I say. A letter. At least I think that's what they're called. I have to make three more. Bob cuddles up next to knock tag. Why, he asks, yawning, because then I'll have a word, a very important word. I dip my fingers into the paint. What word, Bob asks. Home. Bob closes his eyes. That's not so important, he says quietly. Nervous. All day long, I knuckle walk circles around my cage. I'm so ner nervous I can't nap. I can't even eat. Well, not very much, anyway. I'm ready to show Julia what I've made. It has to be Julia. She's an artist. Surely she'll look, truly look at my painting. She won't notice the smudges and tears. She won't care if the pieces don't quite fit together. She'll see past all of that. Surely Julia will see what I've imagined. I watch Ruby trudge sullenly through the four o'clock show, and I wonder, what will happen if I fail? What if I can't make Julia understand? But of course I know the answer. Nothing. Nothing will happen. Ruby will remain the main attraction at Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, conveniently located off I-95. The show's at 2, 4, 7, 365 days a year. Year after year after year. Showing Julia. It's time to show my work. The mall is silent except for, the, for Thelma, the McCall, who is practicing a new phrase. Uh-oh. Julia is finishing her homework. George is sweeping outside. Mac has gone home for the night. I grab knot tag and carefully pull out the folded papers. So many paintings, page after page, piece after piece of my giant puzzle. I pound on my glass and Julia glances over. Fingers trembling, I hold up one of my paintings. It's brown and green, a corner piece. Julia smiles. I display another picture and then another and another, and another, each one a tiny part of the whole. Julia looks confused. But what is that? she asks. She shrugs. It doesn't matter. It's pretty just as it is. Uh-oh, says Thelma. No, I think. No, it does matter. More paintings. George calls out to Julia. He's done for the night. Grab your backpack, he says, and hurry, it's late. Gotta go, Ivan, Julia says. Julia doesn't understand. I have to find the right pieces. I dig through the pile. They're here somewhere. I know they are. I find one, another one, another. I try to hold four of them up against the glass. Bob, I say. Help, help me, hurry. Bob grabs paintings with his teeth and drags them to me. One by one, I shove pictures through the window crack. They crumple and tear. There are too many pieces. My puzzle is too big. Careful, Ivan, Julia says. Those might be worth millions someday. You never know. She arranges the paintings into a neat stack. 
I suppose Mac's going to want to sell these in the gift shop. She still doesn't understand. I shove more out the hole and more and more, all of them, one after another. So Ivan's been painting, has he? George says as he puts on his coat. A lot, Julia says with a laugh. A whole lot. You're not taking all those home with you, are you? George asks. I mean, no offense to Ivan, but they're just blobs. Julia thumbs through the towering stacks of paintings. They might not be blobs to Ivan. Let's leave those by the office, George suggests. Mac will want to try to sell them, although why anyone pay would pay 40 bucks for a finger painting a two-year-old could do, I don't know. I like Ivan's work, Julia says. He puts his feelings into them. He puts his hair into them, George says. Julia waves goodbye. Night, Ivan. Night, Bob. I press my nose against the glass and watch her walk away. All my work, all my planning, wasted. I look at Ruby, sleeping soundly, and suddenly I know she'll never leave the big top mall. She'll be here forever, just like Stella. I can't let Ruby be another one and only. <sighs> that is it for this week. Oh, this book is so good. Um, wow. So this really got a little bit deeper this week. It went from being just a story about animals in a mall to their feelings, their thoughts and their feelings. Um, and how where they are affects them. Um, there are some discussion questions in the back of the book. Um, so one of them I really like says, What does Stella mean when she says a good zoo is how humans make amends? What do they mean by that? A good zoo is how humans make amends. I want you to think about that this week. And um, we'll probably talk about that a little bit in Zoom. Um, do you think we've reached a turning point in the story? Because I think we have. I think we've gone from Ivan just being okay with where he is. Um, I think the moment when he said, it's not a domain, it's a cage. That was kind of the turning point for Ivan. I really like this. I hope you're liking it too. I am going to post the instructional video of me finishing the book next week. We'll talk about it in Zoom this week. I hope you really enjoy it as much as I do. Um, also, just wanted to comment my background changed because I had to eat lunch. So I paused the video, ate lunch, and then moved to another room. So sorry for my background changing randomly in the middle of the video. I miss you guys very much. I hope to see you in Zoom at some point this week. Have a wonderful week, and please message me if you have any questions. Bye.